Hello, and again, welcome to BitDev. I'm Santiago Ramones. Across from me is... Rebecca King Cruz, known as Regina Madre. That is awesome. I'm so excited to have you on. And so let's start with who are you and what do you do? Well, my name is Rebecca King Cruz, and I am an actress and a singer-songwriter, a reality personality, and now an author with a book coming out in April. And I am a mother of five and the wife of actor Terry Cruz. Let's see which one of those we want to get started on. So let's go with music because I'm a musician and I love talking to musicians. And that's one of the main reasons I was excited to have you on. So let's talk about your music. Where did you get started? Well, um, I grew up in a family of music. My mother was an opera singer. And my dad was a multi-instrumentalist. He played the tuba, guitar, trumpet, accordion, piano, and one other, the drums. He passed away when I was very young, but I did have this love for music that came from both of them. And by the time I was about eight or nine, I was taking piano lessons, writing my own songs. And at 13, I started my first choir. Uh, teaching them all original music. And throughout high school and college, I directed several choirs, worked in churches, played in secular bands. I did musical theater uh, up until the day I got married. (laughs) And when I got married, my husband went off to the NFL and I devoted myself to my family. And other than raising my kids, I served in the churches as a music director or worship leader, choir director. And so I kept my musical skills going through those years. And at about, hmm, I was probably about 35, 38 years old when I started going back in the studio, writing, producing, arranging, taking a crack at some of these songs I'd written. Many of those songs never heard the light of day. But finally, in 2015, I released a song called Can I Stay? Um, It's an inspirational song. And I did some appearances with that song, and but had trouble getting radio for it because they didn't think it felt the, it fit the format for gospel music. And um, I actually had one gentleman tell me the song was too sexy <laughs> for gospel. And um, I just continued writing and eventually put out the singles um, that now I'm getting radio on those songs um, as Regina Madre. So... Where does the name Regina Madre, uh, obviously Queen Mother, uh, but why did you go with that name? And I guess, why did you decide to have a pseudonym instead of just your name? Well, I put some songs out under my name. Um, But the thing I found was that uh, everybody wanted to talk about everything else. They wanted to talk about the reality show. They wanted to talk about husband motherhood, which is great. I'm very proud of all those things. But I wanted also people to hear the music without knowing who the singer was, you know, without judging it on my age or my color or my status in life. And, you know, I remember when Paris Hilton put a record out, I thought it was a great record. But all people could talk about is why does she want to sing now? You know, (laughs) she probably always been a singer, but just never let that part of herself be shown. And the song was a hit. And I thought it was a great record, but she didn't make any more music after that. I think partly because people were so unwilling to receive her in a new light. And I observed that there were many other artists who had done the same thing. Her, you know, Gabby Wilson had come out as a child star. And then when she tried to record music as a young adult, it was hard for people to receive her as a young adult. And so she went anonymous as her and kind of rebuilt her brand. And now she's a star again. Um, Many people have done that. Donald Glover came out as Childish Gambino just so that people would just listen to the music and decide if they liked it or not. You know, not, oh, he's an actor. Oh, he's a this, you know. And I said, well, I should do the same thing. And believe it or not, my first two singles that I got on radio I keep holding on in destiny. Even the radio promoters did not know it was me. (laughs) I was hiding behind a manager and I said, just tell them it's Regina Madre. And she's just putting the record out, no pictures, because she doesn't want the focus on her looks. 
And I got lots of radio. Like, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. And then I called the guy because I had done business with him before. I called him. I said, guess who? <laughs> he was like, this is Cruz. I said, yes, it's me. And he he laughed. He thought it was cute that I kind of snuck past all their prejudices and all the, really all the chauvinism too, because so much about music as a female, they all care about what you look like. You know, they want to put you in a bikini, whatever, you know, I, I don't have time for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And if it's good music, it's good music. And, and that's what we love hearing. And you mentioned Destiny. And I, I, I really like that song. So, <laughs> um, what music were you listening to whenever you were first getting started in music? Kind of uh, even the music that your parents were listening to and how that kind of shaped what you were making whenever you were first starting out. Wow. That's a long answer because um, my mother listened to everything from opera to Broadway. Barbara Streisand. Oh, my God. I watched every Barbara Streisand movie that was ever made. Hello, Dolly. The way we were, um, you know, um, what's the other one about Fanny Bryson? Um, Funny Girl. And then Diana Ross, Chaka Khan, Natalie Cole, even the Captain and Tennille. Love will keep us together. You know, my mother loved that song. Um, we listened to Tom Jones, Elvis Presley, um, Dolly Parton. You know, we had a big variety of music. And then my, my father passed away. And my stepdad was an attorney, but he also was a musician. And he played in jazz bands all throughout Chicago. My stepdad played with Cannonball Adderley, with Nancy Wilson, um, Ramsey Lewis. I mean, he had quite a story, you know, and he encouraged me in my music. So jazz was a big influence. Dinah Washington, Sarah Vaughn. Um, I used to love Manhattan Transfer. Uh, you know, their vocal jazz group. And then there's gospel. The Hawkins family, Tremaine Hawkins, Walter Hawkins, Andre Crouch, Amy Grant, you know, Sandy Patty, Larnell Harris, all the greats of the 80s in the Christian industry. Um, and I love Broadway. I went to school for theater. So I wanted to be in Jesus Christ Superstar and West Side Story and um, that was my dream to go to Broadway and dance with Alvin Ailey and then do theater as a, you know, theater actress the rest of my life. I wasn't entirely sure I would ever be a musician because in the city I grew up in, I wasn't the kind of singer they thought was a good singer. Mm. You know, I grew up in a chocolate city and I'm a half white kid, you know, and if you didn't sing like Mahalia Jackson or Aretha Franklin, you know, I sounded a lot more like Carol King, <laughs> you know, and so not having this big voice or this big soulful voice, I just never figured I would sing, you know, I'll, I'll write music for other people. And that's what I did. I came when I started in L.A., I was writing and pitching my songs to gospel artists and um, most of gospel artists. And one of them said to me, well, why don't you sing your own music? And I said, well. I sing, but I wrote this song for Fantasia. I wrote this song for Mary J. Blige, you know. And they're like, well, I think you should sing your own stuff. And that's what I did. So I'm kind of the unlikely, I'm, I'm the hidden singer, you know. So there was the music that your parents gave you, but then what was the stuff that you were listening to that, you know, there's always like, oh yeah, the stuff that like mom and dad play all the time but like this is my music what was your music <laughs> you know one of the first songs that ever really touched me that I actually learned how to play it by ear and I taught myself how to sing it was this old song by Ricky Lee Jones called Chucky's in Love and it was kind of jazzy kind of piano it was kind of a Billy Joel like a female Billy Joel and I remember thinking I could sing like this like I could be this kind of singer and then the other person who really, like I saw myself in that person was Sade. Because Sade didn't do a lot of tricks. She didn't do a lot of melisma and over ad-libbing. She just sang with this beautiful, rich voice. She told stories that were provocative, evocative, very um, timeless. 
and she was just so elegant. Uh, she, she was sexy in a classy way as a female artist. And I just remember going, I want to be like her. So I would say that Charday was my muse for sure. What's the difference between the music that you were doing in church and the music that you were leading these choirs in and then the music that you listen to now and the music that you make? Is it all informed by the same sort of stuff or do you separate those things? There is a separation sometimes in terms of the genre. When I talk about genre, I mean the the instrumentation used, you know, the, the process behind the songwriting. Worship music is intended to be very simple. You know, um, I always say as a worship leader, if you can't get people singing with you by the second chorus, your song is too complicated, <laughs> you know. But that's also true for pop music. Um, it really needs to be simple. Um, so from a writing standpoint, I always write from the piano because I, I'm a pianist. And I jokingly say all my songs were ballads before they were anything else. And most of them are mid, um, slow to mid-tempo. So not a lot very fast on my album. But the difference, I would say, is just in the, um, the focus of the lyric, of course, in the gospel music. The music is always geared toward either being directed directly towards God or it's being directed towards the people telling them about something God did for them, right? So the focus of, you know, it's a love song. It's just a love song to another person. Um, mm -hmm. In my writing that I call secular or popular music, um, the focus is on the storytelling. The focus is on sharing your personal experience, um, what those emotions and feelings were for you, and, um, and understanding that other people go through the same things and that hopefully your music carries some message of hope for um, someone else in your situation. And, and that's why I wrote it. And I felt inspired to write it. I felt inspired by God to write secular music because I remembered how how secular music spoke to me as a teen, how I would often hear answers to my problems, almost like God was speaking to me through the secular song. And um, it kind of broadened my view of seeing life as sacred or secular, but really all of it going together. Yeah, I like that a lot. <laughs> I feel like there's this perception that doing music and motherhood are separate things, like with the example of like Ms. Lauren Hill, uh, who basically gave up her music career to become a mother or on the opposite side with Beyonce, who is still doing her music career while being a, a more recent mother. So it's not quite a question, but like, I don't know, it takes a lot of courage and passion and sacrifice to kind of let go of your career for family. So can you talk about that? Well, I, gave, I will say this, I gave up my career partly because of an unplanned pregnancy. I became a mother in college as a um, just before my junior year. I got pregnant with my oldest daughter. And that's what the song Destiny is about. It's about how I made a choice that had consequences for me, but that powerfully changed my life. Um, motherhood erupted in me a passion I did not know I had. Um, many people counseled and encouraged and even harassed me, telling me I should give my baby away, mm -hmm. that I was too talented to throw my dreams away and raise this child. And that just, all I can say is that I never felt that was the right decision for me. Um, she was a biracial child, so I didn't know how light or dark skinned she would be. I'm half black myself, and so was her father. Um, and so I knew that African-American children could linger in the system. So if I had given my baby to an adoption agency, which I, I did actually take a meeting with a Salvation Army home for unwed moms. And the minute I walked out of that building, and they were very good people, very good people, but I knew it just wasn't the choice for me. And um, I remember sitting down and saying, you know, 
if I was to get two years down the road or three years down the road and I have a good job or I'm, I'm finishing school and I'm doing okay, I would regret giving that baby away. I would feel like I'd want to go find her. So with that thought in mind, I said, well, she and I are just going to do this. And if I never go to Broadway, then I have to promise myself I won't regret it. That's just what I said, because it, I just thought about that little girl like me. Like, you know, and then it didn't seem fair to me to kind of put her on my back like a little backpack and go to New York and leave her with strangers or who knows who. And Lord knows the theater life is full of all kinds of crazy things. And although I was a Christian at the time, I knew that the atmosphere of the entertainment world was not always wholesome. And so I lived in Michigan and I was finishing my degree. I decided to take a course in cosmetology. So I went to beauty school while I was pregnant. And during the time I was finishing beauty school, my daughter was about eight or nine months old is when I met Terry. Hmm. Now, mind you, I was not looking for a husband. I had prayed about a husband when I was a teenager, but I figured I would get married at about 35 years old. So I was like, I'm going to take my baby and we're going to do hair and then we're going to go. I actually, believe it or not, I was going to take my beauty license and my baby, go down to Tulsa, Oklahoma and go to ORU and study to be a minister. And while I was sitting there planning the whole thing, I heard that still small voice in my head say, that's not your purpose. And I was like, well, what is my purpose? You're going to be married and have a family. I'm like, well, who am I going to marry? Because I'm not dating anybody. <laughs> and probably three months later, I met Terry. And it was probably another three months before we knew that we liked each other. And then after we decided we liked each other, probably by the ninth month, we committed to get married. And within a year, we were married. So suddenly, this thing I had prayed for at like 17, here at 22 years old, here he was. And I thought, well, this just feels like the right thing to do. It just, I can't explain it. I just knew that I knew, and so did he. So we got married, and I became this NFL wife. And then we had another baby, and then I had more kids and more kids, and it just never felt like quite the right time for mommy to go do her own thing until we got to L.A. We got to L.A. It's like a, a damn burst open. I started writing. I started auditioning, even though I still had more kids. And the first thing I ever did on TV was a show with my whole family. And, and it seemed like my celebrity, my motherhood is what made me celebrity. And so though I have done what I call a balancing act, I'll release music and then there's a pause and I release some more. And maybe I did, I did a film. I'm managing my son right now. My son is 15. He's a lead actor on a Nickelodeon show. He's third on the call sheet. I'm at Paramount Studios three days a week with my kid. And then his, his big sister goes with him the other two days. So this boy is working five days a week and his sister's auditioning. She's still in high school. He's, so I'm still doing the mom job, but I'm doing it while releasing the music, while writing the book. You know, I, I don't know, to be honest, if I want to go on the road right now. I mean, I know we can't go on the road right now, but even if we could, I might go out and do a date here, date there. But to get on a bus for six months and my kids are still in high school, um, I want them to have their life. You know, I don't want them to sacrifice their life to go on the road with mommy. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it was always my, my desire that my kids have somewhat of a normal life, though we lived in Hollywood. And they really did. For many, many years, they just went to some regular schools, they took ballet, they played soccer. And then once in a while, we go somewhere fancy with dad, you know? And um, 
That for me was my value system. Now, if I had been Beyonce and I'd been touring since I was 16, I probably would do what she's doing. You just hire the help and take the babies with you. And maybe you slow down a little bit, but she's got a lot of people to pay. You know, (laughs) she's an enterprise all in her own. So I think it really is unique to each person how they manage. I mean, like Lauren, Lauren's career took off. I think she had one kid. And then next thing you know, she had a couple back to back to back, you know, and I think she has five children. And um, so I think for her, she felt a little inundated and overwhelmed and decided to pull away. But there also may have been other reasons than just the parenting thing. You know, you have to have tremendous support to be a star and have a bunch of kids and keep your keep your thing going full time. That's a lot. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, she's no longer with the father of her children, I think. So I I think that that maybe lack of support there caused her to say, hey, I got to hunker down and just look out for these kids. So I don't fault Lauren. I um, I love her to death. Um, I hope that she can, you know, come back and and serve her public uh, in a way that works for her. Definitely. Uh, I have to acknowledge the uh, six foot tall husband. So uh, since we're talking about music, <laughs> six foot three, uh, since we're talking about music, uh, what kind of music does he like? And what does he think of your music? I will tell you, he, he did not always like my music because my husband, he really loves like old school hip hop. He loves um, house music, you know, Chicago, Detroit style house. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a big fan of like black coffee and all these, you know, DJ types. Um, We're both big fans of like Robert Glasper and some of these artists that mingle jazz and hip hop and R&B. But he, he likes my music now. (laughs) I used to say he didn't, I said, do you like my song? He's like, oh, it's okay. Cause I'm so like Charday like with it. I'm all mellow and mid tempo and he likes it, but he likes stuff that has heavier beats, you know? (laughs) so i guess going a little bit more on the uh regina madre thing do you separate yourself from the artist that is regina madre is there a sort of separate persona or do you feel like it's it's you all the way through uh there's a little bit of a stage persona for sure I think that as an artist i try to stay true to who rebecca is you know i don't perform write or advocate songs that don't reflect what I believe. So in that, there's a real authenticity. I do know actors and actresses and singers and songwriters who, you know, they may put a song out that's a little this or a little that, and they say, hey, that's my persona, that's not me. Um, As a musician, everything is a reflection of what I believe in who I am. As an actress, not necessarily. Um, I've I've certainly played characters that are contrary to me. All through high school and college, I was always the hooker. (laughs) You know, I was always the bad girl. I'm like, why do I look like a bad girl? You know, but I always was the bad girl. Um, But musically, I view my music as a ministry. I view it as something I give the world to possibly maybe help heal whatever hurt, whatever pain, whatever trauma you've been through and to help, help you through it, help you get through it. That's what music does for me. You know, you have an album coming soon. Uh, Tell me about it. I have about 12 songs ready to release. The strategy right now is to release singles. So I've put out what you want to do, have another single coming and then possibly a third single. Then the other seven songs will go on the EP. Um, I contemplated just dropping single, 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 but probably after that third song, I'm just going to put the rest out as an EP and, you know, let people decide which ones they love from that. Yeah. It does seem like the the strategy has changed uh, over the years that, you know, people don't really put out albums with as much, you know, power or like, you know, a whole overarching thing. Uh, have you wanted to 
do that or are you kind of taking more of a song by song approach? My original intent with this project was to put it out as one unit. And the writing is certainly a reflection of that. But promotion is expensive. And so if you have a song that you feel is a stronger hit, it pays to put your money behind the hit, you know? And so that's why we did uh, radio and digital promotion with what you want to do. The next single behind it, we feel is a hit as well. So we're going to try to push that song out also to radio and try to push the playlisting and all that. The third song I think is a hit, but it's not really r and It's a little more pop singer songwriter with a little bit of a soulful feel to it. But it, I don't know that it would fit on an R&B playlist. So we're going to see exactly where to stick that song. You know, and it's a song that I'm also pitching for movie and film placement because I think it's that kind of song. And um, those are my goals with those songs is radio, but also film and TV, because I feel I write in a very cinematic way and that that my music definitely belongs in a soundtrack. Yeah. (laughs) You've stated in like, I mean, just. Now you said that like you feel like more of a songwriter rather than a singer. So I guess what to you makes the distinction between a singer who writes songs and a songwriter who sings? I think it's just a matter of which one you feel is your greater gift. Um, Or that you have more, maybe more skill, more practice or or of a more natural proclivity. Um, I love to sing. But I also find that um, the stuff about singing that's hard, you know, um, I want my singing to just be easy and natural for me. I I don't want to work too hard, (laughs) you know. Um, So I'm an alto and I have kind of a low voice. I can sing high, but I find that when I sing high and I work on high notes and I work on lots of runs, it just makes me exhausted. (laughs) <laughs> it just, it does not thrill me the way maybe somebody who just loves to sing and that's all they love to do. It it doesn't, the creative process for me is much more exciting. Coming up with the idea, telling the story, and just letting the voice be a simple instrument to tell the story versus the voice being the focus. Whitney Houston to me is a singer. And though she has written songs, I don't know that any of her songs have been really big hits that she's written. Um, Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton is a songwriter. And Dolly can sing, but she's written a lot of hits. You know, Mariah Carey. Mariah is one of the few people who I feel is equally gifted as a writer and a singer. I mean, top 10 hits um, everywhere and vocals that just slay. Uh, Mar- Mariah is a genius. She's just a genius. And people underestimate how amazingly talented she really is because she doesn't tend to play when she sings, but she can play. She writes and she can sing like, like God just inserted Gabriel's voice into her throat. It's just amazing. So because you're releasing music after having kids and living more life than, say, a 25-year-old singer-songwriter like myself, what do you feel are the advantages and disadvantages to starting music for you now as opposed to doing it whenever you were younger? Well, the disadvantages are that I do face discrimination. I think with my ability, my talent, and my songs, my songbook, If I was 18, I would have a record deal. If I was 20, I'd have a record deal. But record labels are interested in young people. And though there are some labels that work with older artists, jazz labels and some independent labels, um, the record business is a business and they want to make sure they can get years of service out of you, you know. And so even to sign someone in their 30s is rare. You know, um, what's her name? Um, Fight song. But they she got signed at 32. She looks very young, but 
she went through a lot, you know, and even like when train was popular, I remember being so grateful that a guy in his thirties, you know, was at the top of the charts at the time. And a lot of these groups that are older, they just lie about their age, <laughs> you know, they dye their hair and go on stage, you know? And so there are certain genres that are much more uh, open to older artists. Country is one of them. Um, even r and I'm finding the r and stations that are playing me, they don't care how old I am because their audience is my age. Because these are like clean r and stations. These are for people 35 and up who don't want to hear all the cussing. They don't want any rap. They just, they play oldies and they play contemporary r and that's clean, you know? So that's the audience I went after. It's like people like myself. Yeah. <laughs> what is the musical territory that you feel you have yet to explore and really want to delve into? And what do you think are your limits, if any, to the kind of music that you can make? I would love to write a hit country ballad. I love mm. country music. I have a couple songs that are a little bit country in the way they feel. I don't know if they're classic country, but they certainly are close. So if I got with some songwriters in the genre, we could probably pull the song in so that it's right down the lane. Um, I still want to record something in the gospel or the CCM um, lane for sure. I want to do some music there. And I've always wanted to sing in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Now, I sing one verse in Spanish on my song, Can I Stay? And I have another single coming out that I sing this, just a little bit of the chorus in Spanish because I've just always loved um, the Spanish language. I took it in high school and I had a big Mexican and Puerto Rican community in my hometown. So I did lots of salsa dancing. I ate lots of Mexican food, um, hung out with a lot of Hispanic kids growing up. I used to say I was like an honorary Latina because of how much I loved the different cultures um, where Spanish was spoken. Um, so that would be a dream come true too, to do something in Spanish. Yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> Is there such a thing as bad music in your opinion? Uh, it's hard to say because I've heard things on the radio that are top 10 and I'm like, that's a horrible song, <laughs> you know, to me. So it's really relative. I personally don't like music that advocates bad behavior. So I won't go into what that is. But all I can say is if you wouldn't want your mother, your sister, or your little nephew doing it, I don't want to hear it on the radio. <laughs> because our kids listen to, and I think that as adults, if we're going to talk about adult subject matter, we need to veil it, right? So the kids don't quite catch on. Or we need to play the adult stuff later at night, like we used to do, you know. I happened to be um, listening on the radio to a Chicago station when I was growing up in Gary, when a DJ took it upon himself to play Erotic City at like 8 p.m. And you weren't allowed to play anything with a cuss word in it till after 10. And he put the song on, and me and my friends were like, Ooh, you know, like, like he played Erotic City and didn't bleep out the cuss word, right? And right on the air, his station manager came on the air. He said, you're fired, go home. And he put the other guy in the booth <laughs> and fired the guy right on the spot. <laughs> and so um, I, I would like a return to protecting our, our young people's ears, but that's hard to do. You know, with digital music, my kids, I'm always having to check their phones and it's too easy for them to get content that's a little on the dark side, you know? And uh, that for me is, I would call that bad music. Yeah. <laughs> Do you separate art from the artist? Uh, as, a sing as a musician, no, I don't tend to. Um, as an actor or actor, yes, I can do that for sure. Because you are portending that this is a character you're playing. Many singers have stated that that their stage persona is a character. So, okay, if that's the way you want to go with it, that's, that's, on, that's on you. I personally feel like music comes from the heart and that's the kind of artist I am. And so um, 
I find it hard to believe if you're singing about something that it's not a reflection of something you either aspire, aspire to do, or have done, or are hoping you can do. <laughs> mm. You know, um, I hear, for example, a song about a girl who's trying to steal another woman's husband. Um, I don't like songs like that. And if I hear a song like that, I tend to think that that artist feels that way and that that's her value system. Then I don't, I wouldn't want to be your friend because you'll be coming after my husband. <laughs> so switching to the deeper questions, what is the role of spirituality or religion in your life? Well, I, like I said earlier, um, I became a Christian when I was 17 and um, I had come to know Christ through a ministry called Youth for Christ that used to have a, like, they were kind of like youth meetings at our high school. And though I had, you know, played in gospel choirs, um, sung in church, went to church periodically with my family, and my grandfather was a minister, my grandparents. Um, I thought that I was a Christian until I sat and listened to some of these young youth group workers talk about how Christianity was a relationship with God. And that changed my life completely. And from that day on till, I have had this kind of walking, talking relationship with God that I feel is very vital. And I can't even imagine who I would be or where I would be without that, because every decision I've made for the last 35, 40 years, I made with prayer. I made feeling that I was being guided or directed or inspired to go a certain direction with my life. Um, and the times that I did not listen to that guidance, I wished I had, you know? Um, so for me, life is about um, the journey of discovery and that discovery being your own self, who you are, what you're here for, why God made you, and that you find that in your relationship with God, and that it transcends what we do religiously. It affects my personal outlook. It affects my beliefs. It affects the way I treat people. It affects all my business dealings. It affects my personal relationships, because it is a, um, a lifestyle of respecting that all others are created in God's image, that I cannot walk on you because you're God's child too. And so I need to be mindful that I give you what I want to receive, that I treat you the way I want to be treated. And that to some degree, we are all responsible for each other's welfare. And that's not to say that I carry you like you're a sack of potatoes and you have no... Uh, worth of your own, but that I can help you, I can heal you, we can lock arms together and make this road of life less disastrous than it has to be through our love for each other as a human race. And that comes from creator that, I mean, to me, without that higher love, without that divine love, why would we love each other? We'd all be out for ourselves. We'd all be dog eat dog, you know? And like my husband loves to say, dogs don't eat dogs. <laughs> you know, that's not natural. Dogs eat uh, chickens, you know, but but that mentality of each one for himself is how we got in the mess we're in now. And that God's just trying to turn us back to what we were before we decided to say goodbye to his ways and, mm -hmm. and to his love for us. And, and that as we return to him, we are restored to who we were supposed to be. And that's the beautiful version of humanity that we're all trying to get to through all these various means, you know, through education, through enlightenment, through um, better communication, we're ever trying to evolve. And it's that inner image of who we're supposed to be that's the restorative. Um, it's like the DNA. It's like the true blueprint that we're all trying to go back to. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's who Christ is. He is that, that blueprint. And that we're trying to become more like him every day, no matter how much we fail. 
<laughs> That's beautiful. What is your definition of God? Hmm. Creator, um, Father, um, enlightenment. He is always truth and enlightenment. Anytime you see things clearly, you just got touched. <laughs> you know, um, he's light. That means he's all light. There's no shadow in him. There's not a dark side to God. Um, we feel sometimes that we have a dark side, but God doesn't have a dark side. Um, the sides we show him sometimes are the ones we want him to see, but he sees our dark side and still loves us anyway. And, and that's, the, that's the kind of love we need. I think um, we couldn't survive if he didn't just throw his arms out and say, I got you, you know, I got you. Just come to me and we'll fix it. And now you have to come my direction because this is the way, not that way. This is the way. Um, and that's the hard part sometimes, but it's the only way. What do you think happens when we die? Mm. I've had a lot of um, experiences with this lately. I lost some people close to me through, uh, through COVID. Um, I do believe in the afterlife. I have heard many stories. I haven't ever passed away and come back. So these are all taken on faith. But between the scriptures and the experiences I've read of people who have gone over, that there are two places you can go. And that uh, one is great and one's not. <laughs> um, but for those of us who have chosen to put our arms and our legs and our hands and our whole selves into God, um, that we go back to him. And that what he has prepared for us is greater than anything we ever saw in our own minds. I just recently read a book called My Glimpse of Eternity, Betty Maltz. And it's an old book, actually. Um, it was popular in the late 70s and early 80s. This lady died three times on the table and tells her story. And she actually went on and wrote seven books. Her first one about her account of heaven. Um, and she shares what a lot of people share about going on to the other side, how amazing it is, how there's people there you know um, that went before you. Um, so I believe in the eternal um, just because of everything I've read and heard about it. And I believe it because the Bible teaches it, you know, and um, I hope we're all going to the right place. <laughs> How do you determine what good behavior is? Well, there are three things for me. I listen to my conscience. Um, there's always that little voice inside you. Whether it's a voice that's saying, slow down. Um, you know, you don't need that French fry. <laughs> um, or don't spend that money, you know. Or the voice that's telling you to do something good, to call your mother, to uh, think of a friend who you haven't thought of in a long time. And suddenly they're on your mind. Call them, you know. Um, I think that good behavior always springs from love. And love is defined as how you want to be treated. Basically, you know, sometimes we can get into. Well, what do I owe other people? Well, what would you want them to do for you? You know, take your same situation. How would you, if you were that person, how would you want someone else to treat you in that situation? And that's what you do. Um, I certainly hold the scripture as a standard. Um, but there are many things in the Bible that are cultural. You know, uh, women don't wear veils in our country anymore. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, there are foods that we can eat safely now because we have refrigeration. Um, so I think when we talk about the scripture, and I'm not taking away from it by any means, I think that there are certain moral laws that are universal that don't change with culture. I think it's always going to be wrong to take a, a human life, and especially an innocent life. I think that unfaithfulness is always wrong. Um, stealing, you know, there, I mean, really like the Ten Commandments 
is about basic as it gets, you know. And even Jesus said, heaven and earth would pass away before one little bit of the law would pass away. So he upheld that there was such thing as right and wrong. Even though he was gracious and he was forgiving, he still said to people, go and sin no more. So he didn't do away with the idea of sin, but he simply gave people new chances to start their lives over if they'd messed them up. And so um, I rely on the Bible, but I also rely on that little thing inside me that there might not be a Bible verse about, you know, there might not be a Bible verse about which college I should go to, Mm -hmm. but I have to listen to my heart because God lives within you. He said, I will write my law on their heart and I will dwell within them. And, And that's the higher awareness than just a book. Yeah. How do we reduce the division between people? Um, I think more more importantly, um, we break down the ways that we're the same. Something you learn when you travel is that no matter how different the culture is, people are the same. Mm -hmm. They smile at the same things. They want the same things. We all want to be loved, respected, appreciated. Um, in whatever way that that manifests itself. And I think that showing our, 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 the ways in which we're different divides us. And um, unless we can do that with love and respect and, and can say, oh, this, this, this culture, this is how they eat, or this is what they wear when they mourn, we can celebrate uh, the differences because we understand the ways in which we're similar. You phrase that. Really, really well. (laughs) Um, Do you believe humans are evil by nature? Um, This is my personal theory. The Bible does teach that we're born into like a fallen world. And so there is something about us that's bent. Um, Even the nicest people, people who are born with great parents and who grow up with great morals and you know we're still inherently selfish we're still inherently prone to put ourselves above others if uh it serves us um if you notice you don't have to teach a child how to lie you know from the time they can talk they know how to say no i didn't eat the cookie (laughs) and they know they did you know um Evil is a strong word, but the Bible does use it. And so, yes, I would say we are inherently sinful, at least on this planet we are, and that there is a need for us to be restored, and that that's what salvation is. And um, and I'm one of those people who I felt I was a pretty good person before I became a Christian. I felt like I, you know, I was a little self-righteous because I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. I still don't drink really, you know, never been high ever in my life, you know, didn't do many things that a lot of my peers were doing because I didn't want to. I didn't think those were good things, you know, Um, but I still needed saving because our lostness is defined by our separation from our creator, not so much by our behavior. Because there are people who are very, very wicked. But you also look at how did they become like that? You know, what did they grow up in? What did they see? And then there are people who just choose. They just, they had a nice family. They had a good upbringing. And they choose to go walk on the wild side and do a lot of bad things. And they tend to have a greater condemnation, a greater guilt. Because they knew better, you know. So. When the Bible says that all have turned astray, I believe that's talking about that inherent brokenness or separation that we have that just has to be restored through our, really through our personal choice to open our heart and just say, hey, God, if you're there, I want to know who you are. Um, I want to believe or I want to be a better person or whatever that yearning is inside us. Again, it's that, that blueprint in our hearts that says, this is what I should be. This is what I am. And that distance between those two 
is where we cry out to God. And I think every human can relate to that. Getting away from the darkness of those questions, uh, (laughs) what are you optimistic about for our future? Wow. As much as technology is a problem, I'm optimistic about the technology that's coming. Technology in healthcare. Uh, We've already seen some really amazing things. I mean, look at how quickly we came up with a vaccine for COVID. That's pretty inspiring that uh, the whole world gathered together and said, we got to fix this. And I think that our collective dream is to make life better. I don't know that we'll ever have utopia until the Lord decides it's time to turn everything to new down here. But I do think that we are living better lives than our forefathers did. You know, you think about when there were pandemics in the past, how many people died. You know, when you think about the wars and the the pestilence and how many women died in childbirth, how many babies died in their infancy before immunizations, you know. So there's a lot that we have achieved as a human race. And I, I give God credit for that. I think that he gives us ideas. And as we search for knowledge, we're illuminated with knowledge uh, as to how to help the human race. So I'm optimistic about technology. I'm optimistic about um, our future. I think our kids are spiritually um, more adept than we were. I think God has a way of touching each generation. There's always a remnant. There's always a fired up group to carry the torch into the next generation. And I think we're just going to see greater things. Um, I don't think that the evils of humanity are going to necessarily go away. Um, The fact that we're still dealing with racism in America does not surprise me. Because as long as uh, there's an evil force in this world, um, there are going to be people who give in to that, who give in to fear, give in to prejudice, give in to ignorance, all those negative emotions and those negative spirits. We all have the choice whether or not to follow that, that inclination, or to resist it and push toward the good. Mm-hmm. And I think that battle will be here till, till the age is up. But I still think as a whole, we're doing better than our ancestors, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I have three more questions for you. What makes you content? Wow. Oh, like sitting on the back porch and eating popcorn with my kids, Mm -hmm. Um, watching them play, enjoy each other, having my husband next to me while I sit and play a song. I'll play music on the piano. I have a piano in my grand foyer. And my husband will come by and start singing with me. He'll say, honey, you play that piano so beautifully. You just make me want to sing. And um, yeah, my family. For sure, my family, my granddaughter. Having a good meal. (laughs) I had a big Sunday breakfast today. Pancakes, eggs, bacon, hash brown. That makes me content. I thought I was going to fall asleep before our interview, but I did okay. (laughs) <laughs> that's those are all beautiful and amazing things what advice do you have for people in general hmm. I know it's cliche but my best advice with people for people is go with God because um I can't think of anything greater that has influenced who I am where I'm going what I'm accomplishing what I'm achieving, what I'm trying to achieve, and the relationships and the the blessings I have in my life, I attribute to that relationship with God. And um, there are a lot of things I could tell you that fall under that category, like be patient, be loving, but those things come when we ourselves are connected to the higher selves. And that's, that's my number one motivation when I speak to anyone is to encourage them to find that, that relationship first. And lastly, potentially, most importantly, cake or pie? 
Oh, that's hard. <laughs> I would say cake. Love all kinds of cakes. And then uh, the sort of second part of that question is uh, what is best cake? Ah, uh, my favorite cake. You know what? I really, I just love good old fashioned pound cake, butter pound cake, or like a bunt cake, bunt chocolate or vanilla. <laughs> just good old fashioned, thick and heavy, the kind that's like 10 pounds on your plate because there's like eight sticks of butter in it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Not good for your heart, but good for your tummy. Mm hmm. <laughs> I was trying to make sure people end up hungry by the end of the podcast. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca, thank you so much for doing this with me. Where can we find you and your things? Well, you can find me. All my social media is Rebecca King Cruz. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I also have a website for the music, reginamadremusic.com. We are also launching the book through Audible. So you can find more about our book on audible.com, Stronger Together, Terry and Rebecca Cruz. And then... Coming up in the fall, Rebecca is launching, yay, a clothing and beauty line. So you be looking for me in the fall with um, Rebecca Cruz Official uh, on Instagram, and we'll be putting out clothing and shoes and handbags and cosmetics. That's awesome. Doing so many cool, wonderful things. So again, thank you so much for doing this with me. I'm Santiago Ramones. I'm Rebecca King Cruz. You can find everything that I do on my website, SantiagoRamones.com. I make music and produce audio. I have an EP, a short album, that is streaming everywhere right now. It's called Soundbites. The music you're hearing right now is from Soundbites. Listen to it on Spotify, Apple Music, and anywhere else you stream music, or buy it on Bandcamp, because a single purchase is the monetary equivalent of streaming it all day, every day, for a year. I'm also working on another album, So if you'd like to hear that at some point, you can buy my music or you can support me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Santiago Ramones. Follow me on Instagram to stay up to date with all the stuff that I'm doing, both at bit.depth and at Santiago Ramones Music. There's also a Discord server in which we discuss deep topics from the podcast, but it's also a community of beautiful human beings. Go to santiagoramones.com slash Discord to join. If you like the podcast, leave comments on social media, leave reviews by saying how much you like the podcast, and tell your friends about it. I really couldn't be doing this without you, and I am so very grateful to continue doing Bit Depth for this long. Thank you so much for listening to and supporting Bit Depth. I always end the podcast with my three things. They shape my life philosophy. Love never fails. It's going to be okay. I might be wrong. <laughs>